Good evening and welcome to the fifth Parent Guardian Workshop of the 2021-2022 school year. My name is Brenda Rachels and I am one of the counselors at the Breakthrough Student Assistance Program. I'm going to ask our translator, Lucian Gardine, to share how to access translation for those who may need it. Buenas noches a todos. Si necesitan interpretación, miren en esta diapositiva. Por favor, busquen abajo de su pantalla. Va a ver como un icono que parece como un mapa mundi, como un globo terrestre. Dice interpretación. Entonces hagan clic ahí y luego en español. Y no olviden también de poner en apagar el audio original. Mute original audio. The Breakthrough Students Subsistence Program and the Caneo Schools Foundation are excited to welcome tonight Gabe Turan, Tina Kuntz, and Alejandra Valencia from Ventura County Office of Education. They are here tonight to share information on vaping and marijuana use, strategies on how to talk to your student, and to share community supports and resources that are available. If any questions arise during the, the presentation, Please enter them in the Q&A box and we will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. This evening's webinar will be recorded and will be posted on the CDUSD's YouTube channel website in a couple of days. I'd like to now turn it over to our presenters and let them introduce themselves. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Brenda. Um, and thank you so much to Conejo, Conejo Valley Unified School District and um, Sashmore and everyone who helped coordinate tonight's um, uh, training. So my name is Gabe Turan. I work for Ventura County Office of Education. As you can see here, my pronouns are he, him, el. And um, I have worked here for Ventura County Office of Education in health programs uh, for the last 13 years. I've spent 19 years in uh, as a professional in the prevention and substance use prevention fields. And I have two addictions credentials in the state of California. And um, I'm just really excited to be here to share this information with you all. This is something that we uh, do day in and day out in our office, and we're looking forward to providing the info. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, Alejandra, to introduce herself. Good evening, parents. Um, like Gabe mentioned, we are really excited to be here and presenting to you this, this information to you all. Um, thank you for taking the time to, to join. But uh, my name is Alejandra Valencia. My pronouns are she, her, and ella. Um, and I've been working in the area of prevention for the last seven years. I actually started in intervention um, back when I used to be at the school sites and doing a lot of case management. And then I figured, you know what, there, we need to really tackle on what's really happening here and why are we getting to this place and um, how do we reach families and youth um, in that area. So uh, I've been working alongside Gabe for the last nine years. I know it's, it sounds like time flies, but um, we're really excited to be here and I'll pass it over to my colleague, Tina. Thank you, Alejandra. Hello everyone, welcome parents, guardians. This, my name is uh, Tina Kuntz and I've been here at the Ventura County Office of Education for the last year and a half. So I am fairly new but I am excited to be here and present this material and this um, information to you guys tonight. So thank you and welcome. Great, thank you both very much. So we're gonna go ahead and dive right into the um, information for this evening. And really we have this presentation structured in a couple of different sections. First, we wanna give you some basic information about addiction in general. and. First things first around that is addiction is like change, change in the brain, change in the body. And with change in general, change can be sudden or change can be gradual. In the case of addiction, it's a very gradual change. And you'll typically see someone who is uh, in the midst of using any kind of substance uh, will start one way. And as time goes on, it just increases a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then in retrospect, they can see the difference or you can see the difference from where they were to where they end up. And so keep that in mind as we go through this. Uh, none of this is uh, any type of issue where it's a one-time thing and the person is now, their life is in shambles. Um, but with change, with addiction, there it's a gradual process. 
but the change of getting out of addiction is another gradual process and nothing is ever impossible with it, but it takes support and it takes all of the work that goes into like what we're doing tonight and also what you can do with your, um, with those in your families and your loved ones as well. So that being said, um, just a thought to think to yourself here, why should people even care about nicotine addiction? In the state of California for adults, uh, cigarette use is down at an all time low. In the county of Ventura, I believe we're in the single digits now for adult use of cigarettes. And so people may have this perception of, well, why are we still talking about nicotine? Like what's the importance of that? And so uh, what we hope that we can impress on you after this section is um, why it's important and where it comes into play. So when we talk about nicotine addiction, we wanna know that first teen addiction is something we need to understand. The brain for the teenagers um, for adolescent development goes until age 25, 24, 25 on average. And the frontal lobe where we do a lot of our kind of high end critical thinking, that's the last part to develop. And I like uh, the comparison of that's like the brakes. So you may think of, um, you know, instances in our own adolescence where we did things like, you know, doing risky like jumps on our bikes or things where someone just dared us to do it. And we're like, okay, I'm going to do it. Right. And um, that was because this part of our brain wasn't fully developed yet. Now, as adults, typically when someone says, hey, jump from the pool or from the roof into the swimming pool, we'll say, well, no, like I have to go to work on Monday and how am I gonna feel about that? And so we have the ability to uh, think critically about uh, co uh, consequences, actions and consequences. So the last thing though, is that um, when it comes to addiction, when substances are, substances are used during adolescence, we have to realize that the adolescent brain is still developing. And so the changes that happen in the adolescent brain during that time are important developmental pieces for their uh, development from children to adolescents to adulthood. So when substances are introduced, what happens is it hijacks that development and it makes things um, change in the way that they do things. When we're adolescents, we learn how to deal with emotions. We learn how to deal with challenges and difficult situations. And it's that time between childhood and adulthood where we really start growing in that way. But because of that, um, that change, it also primes the brain for addiction when substances are introduced. So that last bullet point, um, youth become addicted faster than adults do because of what's happening in their brains at that time. And it's more difficult for them to quit. So keep in mind as I go to this next slide here that 90% of the adults today who are uh, people who typically or daily use nicotine devices, whether it be traditional combustible cigarettes or e-products, 90% of them started using those products as teens. And now as adults, they continue to use them and we'll talk about what that looks like um, throughout this presentation. So now I wanna talk about the um, stages of addiction and what that looks like. And for adolescents, it typically falls into these four stages here. And it starts with experimentation, and it's exactly what it sounds like. A person will try a substance, maybe they're curious, maybe they're peer pressured, um, you know, for whatever the reason is, they try it once and that's experimentation. Some young people may try, they may never try. But if they do try and they think, wow, that wasn't too bad, you know, I'll try it again, then that's moving them along the experimentation phase. So they use it a little bit more, a little bit more, and they go into the next phase, which is called social or recreational use. In this phase, what's happening is there's more frequency of use, but it's also associated with kind of like social at gatherings or fun things. And the brain starts associating substance use with a good time, good feelings, or having fun. And um, I hope you can understand the risks that come along with that because if our brain associates something that is having a negative effect on our brain or our brain development with fun and good things, our brain's gonna continue to have us doing that thing, right? So the association of good times and fun really gets this perception around, um, a, a positive perception around substance use. Then the frequency continues a little bit more, a little bit more, and they move into the third stage, which is called misuse. And in this stage, 
there's a higher frequency of use. And there is typically um, uh, such a high frequency of use that you know negative things might start happening. Maybe grades go down. Maybe they have arguments with friends or parents or significant others around their use. And the, the use continues and they go to the last stage, which would be addiction. And I wanna tell you that the difference between the third and the fourth stage there uh, is two things. One is tolerance, the other one is withdrawal. So tolerance meaning it takes more of the substance for the person to feel the effects and withdrawal meaning they feel negative in some way, whether it be physically or emotionally when they're not using or they're recovering from the substance. So that last stage has those two components in it. And you may see that dotted line going down the middle there. And that's actually a very important distinction because negative things can happen to a person at any one of those stages, even in the experimentation phase, the first couple of times they use, they may get caught, they may get sick, they may have a bad reaction, they may get in a fight with somebody. And the thing is in the first and second stage when negative things happen directly related to substance use, typically a young person will say, well, that's not worth it. I don't wanna do it anymore. But when they get past that dotted line in those, the third and fourth stages, when negative things happen, instead of recognizing that, Instead, the brain says, well, if I had gone left instead of right, I wouldn't have gotten caught. If so-and-so wouldn't have been there, they wouldn't have caught, drawn attention to us, and we wouldn't have gotten in trouble. If my boyfriend or girlfriend would just let up a little bit, or my parents, then I wouldn't be in this situation. And they make these justifications for why everything else is the problem, but not the substance. And I hope you can see why that is a um, really difficult cycle for them to get into and get out of. And so those are the four stages that I want you to be aware of. Know that someone can quit it any time in those four stages, but the further along in the continuum they get, the more difficult it is to, to, to quit, to walk away. Know that also the effects of addiction are lifelong. The changes in the brain that happen to a young person when they introduce substances rewires their, their brain and the way that they're developing. And those changes are often permanent. And it really affects the way that they make decisions later in life, the way they respond to um, stress or challenges, things that we learn in adolescence. But now they, when they don't have the substance later in life, if they walk away from it, it's something that they, it's a development that they didn't do when they needed to do it during adolescence if they quit later in adulthood. And know that um, with these, situations, even after they permanently discontinue their use, it can still affect the way that they make decisions or the way they react to things later in life. So that's part of the prevention piece of trying to have adolescents and parents and our community members understand why we need to be preventive and what, have our young people be well-informed in substance use. So now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Tina, who's gonna to talk to us about one of our subjects tonight, which is vaping. Thank you, Gabe. Um, so now that we have gone over addiction, let's go over e-products and e-cigarettes. E-cigarettes first entered the market around 2007 and they have evolved uh, many times since then. The first one here on the top left looks like a traditional cigarette. That's your first generation of e-cigarettes. Uh, they were disposable and sometimes referred to as cigalikes. The second generation of uh, vape pens, they were colorful um, jewels, maybe different characters. Uh, they look like, look like pens and come in both uh, pre-filled and uh, fillable cartridges. The mods or the tanks um, the, the, that you see in the middle there in the center of the screen is um, they were also refillable, but you could customize these e-products. Uh, you could have more nicotine, bigger, uh, uh, bigger tanks to fill more, to hold more of the e-liquid. And then our newest generation of e-cigarettes, uh, sometimes called pods, these are the ones that are popular today with our youth, are the Jewel, the Soren, or the Puff Bar. Um, these products feature a sleek, high-tech design, and they are disposable and have easily rechargeable batteries. They can also be uh, pre-filled or refillable with the solution or the e-juice um, and that contains a nicotine salt. 
These e-cigarettes are shaped like USBs. Um, they have pods with higher amounts of nicotine than previous, the previous generations. Uh, as I had mentioned, the, the e-juice or the solution um, that, that almost always contains nicotine, flavorings, and chemicals, and there are thousands of those um, on the market today. Um, so with these new generation of e-cigarettes, they look like ordinary items that you might find around the house or at school, such as USBs, uh, flash drives, markers, um, some look like pens or even uh, chargers for phones or um, banks, charger banks. Um, it's challenging to decipher between what an ordinary item is and what an e-product is. Um, here are some of the examples and some of the names are um, like the Soren. It's kind of the, the triangular drop looking one. There's the Jewel um, and of course the Puff Bar, which is a disposable e-cigarette and they can be sold in flavors unlike the, uh, the Jewel, which now have these government regulations on them. Um, but because the Puff Bar is a device built for single use, it's exempt from these FDA enforcement guidances. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind, um, the most popular devices among today's youth, all of them contain high, the highly addictive ingredient, which is nicotine. Um, uh, so the Puff Bar, that's become a popular e-product. Um, it's most popular, uh, the most popular disposable device among youth because of its one-time use. Uh, it comes in appealing flavors um, and it's not subject to those regulations, uh, federal regulations, and the fact that they are disposable. Each uh, puff bar does contain, uh, uses the nicotine salt, which is a formula that allows for much higher levels and delivers the nicotine with less irritation compared to the early generation of e-cigarettes. Um, you can see here these, the different flavors. There's mango, sour apple. Um, there's just one of, just a few of the many flavors that Puff Bar carries. Um, and similar to the way tobacco companies in the past have marketed flavored products to appeal, to, to appeal to our youth, uh, Puff Bars also emphasize flavors and the, with their bright packaging and their um, really descriptive names, very cool sounding. So um, they flavors play a significant role in drawing youth and young adults to start smoking. In fact, 97% of youth who vape use flavored e-cigarettes. Um, actually, flavors are a top reason why young people began using e-cigarettes. Uh, so far, we've gone over what what the e-products look like um, and the links that tobacco va and vaping companies have gone to entice young people, but what does the data show? So we wanna look at this graph. This is uh, the California Healthy Kids Survey um, and it's specific to Ventura County. Um, and you can see the lifetime uh, use by students uh, using traditional cigarettes versus e-products or e-cigarettes. Uh, they've got seventh grade here, there's a difference. Uh, traditional cigarettes of 2%, whereas for seventh graders, it's 10%. And then you can see ninth grade, they have a percentage of 22% of using e-products. And then in 11th grade, a 30%. Um, now, while we are passing on the knowledge of the harm smoking cigarettes causes, um, there's still more work to be done when it comes to vaping. And as you can see by the data that shows here, we are... Um, the single digits for the traditional cigarettes. Um, that's just all the knowledge that has come down and we've been passing along to our youth. Um, but young people who vape are not only risking um, nicotine addiction, but the effects of nicotine exposure should, could also be harming their brain development, altering nerve cell functions and changing their brain chemistry. Uh, so, and knowing that um, youth, knowing that information about the youth that we just saw, remember that nicotine is the main addictive component. And also recall that all of, of the 
popular e-products among youth today contain nicotine. So how much nicotine are we talking about? Uh, we're gonna use Juul as an example. Um, in research by Stanford University School of Medicine, they found that one Juul pod equals 41.3 milligrams of nicotine. And what does that mean? That is equivalent to a little over two packs of cigarettes. So 41 cigarettes um, of traditional combustible cigarettes. Um, and if we take the disposal, the, the, the disposable e-product, the puff bar, that has five milligrams of nicotine, which is 50 milligrams, or excuse me, 5% of nicotine, which is 50 milligrams. Um, so one puff bar has 300 puffs, which is equivalent of two and a half to three packs of cigarettes. And that is a lot of nicotine in an e-product. So as we know, e-cigarettes, vapes release the plume of smoke in the air and in it's usually commonly referred to as vapor. So hence the name is vaping or vape pens. But this word is very deceiving and it isn't just water vapor, water vapor at all. It's more than that. It sounds harmless, but it isn't vapor and it can be harmful with the chemicals and the various metals found in the vapor or smoke. Um, so if it isn't vapor, then what is it? It's an aerosol. It's a sticky substance that lingers in the air and falls on surfaces and it sticks to things like someone's lungs. The aerosol that spins the oil and chemicals from the e-product are definitely not harmless water vapor, water vapor um, that has been portrayed as in the past. Um, so now I'm gonna pass it over to Alejandra who will continue with our presentation. Thanks, Tina. So as you just mentioned, what is the biggest manipulation of it all is in the name. And um, as Gabe mentioned, the manipulation with young people and what these tobacco companies and now these e-companies are doing with young people is man manipulating them. Um, they're hijacking, right? Do these people know that um, teens and young people are more likely to get addicted a lot faster? Yes, they know that. So what I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit more is why the appeal? Why um, why has this trend gone up um, with young people? As Gabe mentioned earlier in the presentation, the amount of cigarette use has gone down drastically within the last couple of decades. Why? Because we have the education to back it up. We have data to back it up. Um, we have the health effects to back it up. And really with young people, they know that it's bad, right? So what do these companies do? They decide to actually recycle um, an old marketing tactic and it's just a basic marketing tactic. And I'm actually gonna talk a little bit about that um, and the work that we do with young people as well is really um, have them hone in on you know some critical thinking skills and this could apply to anything. So I'm actually gonna be talking about the advertising, the marketing aspect of this. And as you see on your screen, you're able to see very familiar, um, a very familiar brand, right? Which is Lucky Charms. What do we notice about these images? They cover the bright colors, the sweet flavors, and the very easy to remember names. I know that we are adults, we're an adult audience here, but think about the time when you were introduced to these products, right? Chances are is that you were not introduced to these products and people were not introduced to these products past the age of 25. Right. We all recall these this and chances are is that we still eat these products. Right. But we started out and for those that still consume these products really, really young at a younger age. Why? Because it's it's an easier. So if I if I am a company and I am a, a company that I know that is a, a trying to appeal and get a long term customer, these are the three things that I need to get a long term. Uh, long lasting uh, buyer. And I just need to hone in on these three things, bright colors, sweet flavors, and very easy, cool sounding, um, easy to remember names, right? Tina mentioned Jewel, Soren, um, you know, a puff bar. Did you, if you remember, if you recall the images, they do, do they all have those 
three things? Absolutely. Uh, very easy to remember names, their bright colors. Um, in the previous image, you saw the variety of different uh, devices, right? And they all have all those three things. Um, we could go on to the next slide. Again, a very simple tactic. We all recall these images, Skittles, Kit Kat, Reese's, M&M's. Um, these are all um, products that were introduced to, to folks and young people at a very young age. And we could say this about ourselves, right? They're very easy. Think about McDonald's, In-N-Out, all those, all those um, uh, businesses or uh, brands, they all have those three things. And chances are, is that consumers are going to continue to buy into those products because chances are, is that they were introduced to them at a very young age. And that was the intention. That was the intention behind it. Companies know, marketing companies know, these companies know, uh, vaping companies know that, hey, we don't actually need to reinvent the wheel. We could just take a very, uh, uh, a structure that has worked in the past and we're gonna go ahead and redo that. And that's exactly what they did, right? Which is in those previous numbers, yes, cigarette, um, cigarette, uh, uh, use has gone down because of the education and those preventative efforts that um, have taken so long um, to get us there. But we're there. The great thing is that we're there, but now we're actually redoing it all over again. Um, and, and those companies know exactly that uh, it's easier to get young people addicted faster than adults. Um, it's much easier to really promote these products as safe. Um, think about vaping, think about they, they uh, gaslight young people into really thinking that it actually is vapor and not an actual aerosol that contains thousands of chemicals and it's actually a sticky substance. You know, think about aerosol when you spray, when you spray hairspray onto a wall, right? It's a very sticky substance. That's actually being um, ingested by a lot of folks and that actually stays there, right? So look at this image, bright colors, sweet flavors, and a very easy to remember name. Again, the same marketing tactic that that worked in the past, right, um, is actually being recreated all over again. And if you notice, one pod, and that is an actual flavor pack. So, um, as Tina mentioned, one pod alone um, equates to about forty-one cigarettes. That's forty-one cigarettes. That's that's the potential nicotine being ingested into somebody that is using uh, these products, and they come in fours. All right, so think about one pod. If someone is consuming about four pods uh, within the week, that's a lot of nicotine that is being ingested. So a couple, uh, a couple of years ago, nobody really knew how much nicotine was in one pod or in one puff. So we are, so this information is coming out and I'm so glad that we actually have it now because back then this is very, um, it's, it's happening very quickly. And even just with the puff bar alone, as we mentioned, because of regulations with Juul and um, them intentionally strategizing to target young people, they actually were like, what do you mean we're targeting young people? What do you, what do you mean? Um, we're not targeting the young people. What do you mean about these flavors? We're not intentionally doing that, but, in, but everything else shows otherwise. Great, thank you very much, Alejandra. So, um, that being said, we gave you some foundational information about um, addiction and now um, e-products and vaping. And we also wanna to touch on, well, what about THC and cannabis? And I hope by the end of this section, you'll see where those two things intersect of vaping and THC or cannabis and kind of how things have evolved from uh, the traditional view of cannabis use um, among youth and adults. So what we're gonna be focusing on are, are cannabis concentrates. And if you haven't heard of those, that's okay because we're gonna talk about them a little bit, but know that if you ever hear the term wax or dabbing, um, that's where this kind of originates from. The idea being that a person um, can get uh, regular cannabis or flower or marijuana, and they can you know, put it into a, um, an extraction device that will use chemicals to extract the THC 
from the cannabis or the marijuana. And when that THC is extracted, it creates what's uh, a film or like a wax. And um, that wax, which kind of looks like earwax, um, hate to sound kind of gross, but that's uh, the best description of it. That is concentrated cannabis. And it can have, um, you know, uh, a concentration as low as 50% or all the way up to the 90s and uh, 90%. Um, but that's what's the main ingredient in using, or excuse me, in creating edibles and THC cartridges, which are really gonna focus on now. So starting with edibles, edibles tend to be the products that a person will eat in order to ingest the cannabis or the concentrated cannabis. Uh, with edibles, the things to be aware of are, it takes longer to fill the effects for the person who's eaten it. Um, one serving can vary in potency. So a brownie that's purchased from one place um, or one, uh, one type of manufacturer which may look exactly like another brownie can have a different potency. And uh, if it was um, made and purchased in a cannabis uh, dispensary, there's supposed to be a little bit more regulation on it. But if there's loose regulation or it was purchased from just somebody on the street or a friend or something, um, there's absolutely no uh, quality assurance in knowing what the potency actually is. There's also no way to just sober up, um, you know, when somebody has too much on board, which I'll talk about in a second, there are a number of negative effects that happen to that person, which can happen very easily from concentrated cannabis, whether it be edibles or THC cartridges. But a person has to wait it out. They can't just take a, you know, drink coffee or take a shower or eat something and um, sober up. The it has to cycle through their body in order to, um, you know, get over the effects that they're feeling if they're having a negative experience. And also uh, we're gonna talk about similar marketing strategies that maybe uh, you're aware of, maybe you're not. So the strategies that Alejandra just talked about with the bright colors, sweet flavors, or the easy to remember names, um, hopefully you can see the uh, discrepancies we have here as well as the similarities. And um, on the left, we have the uh, more mainstream products that are non-cannabis products. And on the right, we have actual edibles. And then as you can see here, we have another example. And um, you know, when you look at them, it's kind of like, well, what's the difference, right? Well, those differences can sometimes be very subtle. Sometimes they're obvious when you look at them. And if you're looking at this Cheetos one thinking, well, what's how, that's regular Cheetos, right? Well, I'll draw your attention to this little thing right here that is the um, indicator that it has THC, it's a THC product. And then for the last one here is another example. You can see these take on the look of um, traditional cereals, but they have those um, three components, bright colors, sweet flavors, and an easy to remember name. Uh, so one thing we wanna keep in mind with this is that these products are certainly intended to um, be consumed by someone who has the intention of consuming edible concentrated cannabis. But I hope you can also see with the things like the chips or the candies we showed earlier, how someone might mistake them for the more mainstream non-cannabis products, right? And unfortunately, if you have a young person or a child who finds those and thinks that they're regular gummies, um, probably like one gummy or two gummies is recommended for the, uh, for the serving. And if someone eats a handful of them, you can see how that is um, the potential for an overdose or overingestion. And so now just to kind of round things out on that, when we talk about the THC cartridges, if you think back to the slide where uh, Tina had shared the different devices that uh, we have today the new generation of vaping devices. Well, the preferred method for ingesting cannabis now by young people is either edibles or these THC cartridges. The thing with these THC cartridges, just like the nicotine vaping devices, they have um, either a fruity smell or a sweet smell that is the byproduct of the person exhaling it, or they have no smell at all. So that versus the historical somebody um, smoking cannabis or marijuana, and when it's exhaled, it has a very distinct um, odor to it. That's not a factor when it comes to these products. 
And so uh, with the, um, referring back to the slide Tina showed, there were THC products in there that were um, vaping pens that are for, with THC cartridges in them. And typically a um, giveaway is that it'll have this like clear uh, piece here that has this liquid, uh, like a golden colored liquid in it. And you can see the gold color here. But otherwise they may look like regular vaping devices and someone wouldn't know they have THC or they may look like regular devices like uh, highlighters or USB uh, devices or pens. Um, or unfortunately there are instructions that are easy to find for young people on how to get regular devices like Juul or Puff Bar and take them apart and modify them to accept concentrated cannabis. So unfortunately, there's a lot of things we have to work against in order to go over this. But as I mentioned, these products can have 80% plus THC concentration versus uh, cannabis, which is smoked in the flower form, um, which may be you know, as low as a 10% up to 20%. So if we're talking 50 to 90% and with concentrated THC cartridges, 80 plus, I mean, that's a high concentration. When it's vaped, it's the effects hit faster and they are stronger. There's a potential for unintended ingestion or an overdose. So someone can maybe take too much of the THC cartridge or they would eat too much of the edible. And as was mentioned earlier, they can't just sober up from it. They have to wait that out. And oftentimes people unprepared for that will end up in emergency departments with paranoia and racing heart and really um, something that might look like a, a panic attack or an anxiety episode. And maybe they're not being forthcoming about what they had ingested, but once they do, emergency room folks know, okay, well, we're gonna put you in this room. We're gonna wait a few hours and monitor you and they'll wait that out. Uh, there's also the same issues that were mentioned when, when we talk about THC cartridges, the sweet flavors and also the low perception of harm. Just as with vaping for nicotine, young people and even adults may feel that, oh, well, if I'm vaping it, it's not smoking and it's safer for me. Well, that is not the case. And as we'll talk about later with health effects, there's still a lot of research to be done on what the actual long-term effects are. And lastly, there's the same risks, the developing teen brain and misuse that comes along with it. Uh, it there, a common question is, well, is cannabis or marijuana, is that even addictive? The answer is yes. The changes it does in the brain and the fact that it can lead to tolerance and withdrawal leads to someone having cannabis use disorder where it's difficult for them to function or get through the day without using cannabis, meaning they are now dependent on it. And it, are they going to look like someone who's sick in bed and just completely physically ill from not using? They won't look like that, but know that it would be difficult for them to quit even if they want to. And that's the distinction we want you to make. And know that with young people, as with all other substances, it can happen quicker for them and it's harder for them to quit. So that being said, I'm gonna turn it back over to Ala who's gonna talk about social media. Thanks, Gabe. Um, we're in different times, right? We're using social media at, you know, with pandemic, pre-pandemic um, and, Vaping companies know this. Um, so with this, it's social media challenges. We see them all over um, TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, YouTube. Um, like Gabe mentioned, there's different videos on how to really um, take these devices apart and, and keep in mind that with the cartridges, um, they're not made to be refilled. Um, so also keep that in mind. Um, and with social media challenges, along with uh, the manipulation and marketing portion of it, um, comes along this free marketing and free advertising that um, back when tobacco companies, you would actually see commercials and advertising. And uh, for those that um, were long, that are, you know, long-term users, they would get, I remember my dad would get, um, little catalogs in the mail about if you turn in your um, your little stubs, then you get to claim this this prize. 
Um, and that was the big brand Marlboro company, right? So that was their way. That was their way of marketing and advertising until you, until regulation said, you know what, these are actually very harmful for you and wipe them off uh, the advertising um, um, TV and ads and such forth, which is now, again, they're not reinventing the wheel, folks, but there's actually more platforms that uh, folks have easier access and what better way than social media um, and influencers and ambassadors to really market their product um, and marketing their product for free. Um, you have these influencers that um, are essentially, in a sense, being manipulated to um, get this free clout, right? And not just clout, I mean, you know, no pun intended, but uh, this free clout on how to promote these products and have other folks uh, forward and share. And so this is way above uh, what was done decades before um, vaping and uh, e-products. So social media challenges, like um, who can um, ingest, who could create the biggest plume, the biggest uh, vape cloud. Um, Cyber Monday, if you see that diff different vaping companies are, use are utilizing the social medias to really hone in on their audience and utilizing the algorithms and investing um, money into their products so it could get uh, delivered faster. Again, think about those bright colors, very easy to remember names, um, and cool looking devices, uh, very aesthetically pleasing um, to a young eye and even the adult eye. So, and again, because of that perception of harm, when young people, you know, they have a favorite influencer or they follow uh, someone, um, you know, online or their TikTok, um, and they see that and they have a very low perception of harm, um, thinking, well, this is not a cigarette. It doesn't have, it's not going to have the same effects. Well, think about with cigarettes and um, that that perception of harm and there was a profile back when right with vaping there is no profile so it appeals to mostly everybody right so everyone has a social media all young people have social medias um and they're clearly invested in this so companies know this um so what better way to even promote to more promote their brand by using hashtags and really promoting these social media challenges and utilizing other young people to go ahead and market their products on these platforms awesome thank you alejandra um now we want to just talk about the health effects health effects of uh e-cigarettes and vaping um, there's little known because it's um, only been around for the last decade or so, but um, short-term effects are dry cough, um, headache, dizziness, um, irritation of the eye, mouth, uh, mouth ulcers, uh, as well as allergic reactions. And um, long-term effects are still um, unknown, uh, especially in youth. However, early the earliest concerns come from studies that have found the presence of heavy metals in the aerosol um, that come out in the vape and into the user's lungs. And uh, so what long-term exposure to these heavy metals in 10, 20, say 30 years, what is that gonna look like? Um, we don't know, but we do know that ingesting and inhaling heavy metals such as nickel, lead, and zinc is putting one's brain, lungs, and their body at risk. Um, it has been perceived as a low risk, but because what we think we know about vaping, um, that it's just harmless flavors and it's just harmless water vapor, we know that, um, but many do not realize that it has many harmful chemicals as well as the addictive nicotine. Um, and then secondhand exposure, uh, we know that the aerosol is not just a water vapor. And so this secondhand aerosol exposure is a concern um, for everyone around us. Um, they're exposed to a variety of chemicals, especially the, the heavy metal like lead that's in the aerosol. And this is a concern for everyone, our families, the, our children, even our pets uh, being exposed to the secondhand vaping and smoking exposure. 
So with that, that wraps up our presentation. Um, and lastly, we want to mention we have a number of resources for both adults and teens to find more information about the things that we talked about tonight, um, as well as uh, how someone can find help in choosing to discontinue their use. Uh, we want to thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we have now we have some time left for questions and answers. Okay, thank you so much. You guys are a terrific team and learning so much. Um, we do have some Q&A questions that uh, families submitted when they registered, and we also have the Q&A open. If there's any questions that you would like for them to answer, please drop that in the Q&A and we'll get through as many as possible tonight. Um, the first one is uh, one of the parents wrote in and wanted to know how can they help their child stay strong against peer pressure when friends and, and acquaintances around them are using? Great, thank you, Brenda. I'd be happy to uh, address that one. So peer pressure, if we think back to when we were adolescents, did we experience peer pressure? And not doesn't necessarily have to be peer pressure to use substances or to smoke or anything like that, but peer pressure to do things that we weren't really sure if we wanted to do or not, right? Well, today's teens, um, they also experience peer pressure for many of those things that we experience it for. But as Alejandra had mentioned earlier, there are, um, things that they are experiencing that we did not. When uh, we were young, uh, you know, they, we could go home and not be exposed to peer pressure anymore. But now when you go home, if you go on social media and you're seeing ads for vaping or you're seeing influencers using them or maybe even peers using them, their peer pressure is still there. And um, what I wanna point out is that no matter what, we have to be able to start having those conversations with our children early and often about um, these risks, about having them be well-informed about uh, what comes along with substance use, and also what our expectations are of them as parents and being very clear on that around substance use. Those clear expectations and those conversations can go a long way with young people. Know that on the other side of that, our school system is also reinforcing uh, this education and these, this information through their Tobacco Use Prevention Education Grant, which Conejo Valley Unified does have as well. And um, for example, in sixth grade, they receive a curriculum called Catch My Breath. And then seventh and eighth grade, they receive a curriculum called uh, Project Alert. And with built within that, part of it is around peer pressure and having open discussions around it, and also coming up with very realistic uh, resistance practice and resistance skills to know if you were in a situation that you felt like you were being peer pressured, what are some very tangible ways that you can counter that? And what are your positive peers and positive influences you can lean on to help you with that and even be, be um, kept from peer pressure because you're around positive peers, right? So um, conversations early, frequent, and expectations clear, that can go a long way. Great, thank you. Um, if someone else... Gabe, are you one, one, someone on your team? Does it affect my teen's ability to drive? So if they're using, can they drive later that night? So one of the parents was wondering, how does that affect their ability? Yes, I'll be happy to take that one too. Um, as the uh, addicted uh, substance or the certified addiction treatment counselor here. Um, so just biologically, any substance that impairs anybody of any age, they should not be driving, uh, whether it be cannabis, alcohol, uh, you know, uh, prescription medication and prescription medication will say on the bottle, do not drive or operate heavy machinery when you're using this. Uh, so when it comes to marijuana or cannabis, um, teens, young adults, adults, seniors, they really shouldn't be driving when they're under the influence of it because it affects uh, your judgment and your coordination. Two very important things that are needed in order to drive and be effective with that and react in an emergency situation. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there a test that you can use to see if your child has been vaping? Is there something out there that you can buy? Uh, well, there aren't any um, drug tests like for, for vaping or for nicotine, but the things to look for, I think Tina um, kind of alluded to it in her um, section, is look for devices that maybe your um, child is kind of hanging on to a little bit more or, uh, you know, they're really attached to that USB flash drive for some reason, right? Um, but also uh, 
be sure to be aware of, you know, you're having smelling these like very sweet smelling or fruity smells in their room or in their backpack uh, or in the bathroom. Um, if you notice a drastic change in behavior, like being more secretive or withdrawn and for certain reasons or unexplained reasons, maybe a drastic change in friends is something that you might see. Um, any of those little changes are not um, uh, clear indicators that something's, you know, they're using vaping devices, but something's going on with those changes as well. And that's where it comes back to what we just said about having clear communication early on and frequently with them so that it's not out of the blue when you want to touch on this subject when you have a concern that comes up. Okay, thank you, Gabe. I think that kind of runs into the other question we had of being how to monitor if kids are using. So checking all of their, their stuff they have, the devices, their behavior, so all the different things that you listed. Um, I had a parent that just put in the Q and A. Um, how can they help their children or support them if they are to quit vaping or quit using marijuana? So if they feel like they're struggling. Yes, I'm going to put our resource page back up here. There's a QR code and there's a, um, a URL there that you can type in at your convenience. But know that that landing page has some information on everything we talked about tonight, but also has resources to the um, two items you see on the left there, our Ventura County access line for substance use treatment services, as well as the call it quits for Ventura County for folks who want to quit using nicotine products. And that is for um, youth and adults. And for the bottom one for nicotine cessation, that is at no cost to residents in the state of California, regardless of age, regardless of uh, you know, income, that is provided at no cost by the County of Ventura and the state of California. And for uh, Ventura County for substance use treatment services, that is provided often for youth at no cost because it's based on their income, um, regardless of their parents' income, um, or it can be uh, provided at low to no cost for adults as well. Uh, so those are really great resources to start with. The other one I'll mention is 211 which you can call from any phone in Ventura County. You'll be connected with an operator and you can tell them what kind of services you're looking for. And they will tell you the different agencies and services that can be provided based on what you were, uh, the criteria you were looking for. And I don't know if uh, our Conejo folks wanna jump in on anything else there. No, I think that's it. Um, we just wanna thank you so much for coming out tonight. So. Um, as we conclude our presentation, we want to thank Gabe and Tina and Alejandra for sharing information on vaping marijuana. Um, the videos will be posted on the CVUSD YouTube channel in a, in a few days. Um, if you feel that your student is struggling, please begin by reaching out to your student school. We have wonderful school administrators and school counselors that care about your student and will work at identifying and providing additional supports if needed. Um, the Breakthrough Program works closely with our school administrators and counselors and is available to all CVUSD students and families. We also want to thank all of our parents and guardians for attending tonight's event brought to you by the Caneo Schools Foundation and the Breakthrough Student Assistance Program. We look forward to seeing you at, at upcoming events. So have a good night and thank you again. <laughs>